the lifeblood of a democracy is your ability to understand and act upon a problem once the facts are presented to you. The purpose of this motion picture is to give you the facts, and then you, as individuals and citizens of a democracy, must take action. Every culture on the planet Earth is always changing, sometimes rapidly and sometimes very slowly. These changes occur in different ways. One is through diffusion of culture traits from one culture to another. The primitive native quickly adopts many of the advanced culture's tools whose value is readily apparent to him. On the other hand, primitive culture traits like the Indian maize are quickly adopted by the advanced cultures who see value in them. As the science of agriculture advances, the world will be better fed and clothed and housed. You too will reap great harvests. Today, agriculture is going far beyond nature to produce new miracles for an even better, more abundant life. On the farm today, wherever you look, you see the handiwork of scientists. Improved crops, more productive soils, more useful, more efficient machinery. They are the result of a miraculous agriculture. Wholesome, wholesome, wholesome goodness. Wholesome, wholesome, wholesome goodness. Wholesome, wholesome, wholesome goodness. Productions. Present. In the harvest of 1999, 60% of Canada's canola crop was genetically engineered, 90% of Argentina's soybean crop, 50% of the U.S. soybean crop, 33% of the U.S. corn crop was genetically engineered. Industrial agriculture is damaging the basis for future production. We've got soil erosion, soil compaction, salinization, water logging, destruction of beneficial biodiversity, loss of natural enemies of pests. That's really occurring at an alarming rate. Three things needed to come together to make the Green Revolution work. One was the development of specific high yield varieties and often dwarf varieties of wheat or rice and also corn that were derived by special outcrossing and hybridization techniques that Norman Borlaug perfected working in Mexico and also in the southwestern United States. Secondly, there was a tremendous investment of funds from the Rockefeller Foundation and the World Bank to assist uh, poor countries to develop a broader food base based on these resources. And then third, there was a tremendous availability and input and requirement for pesticides, fertilizers, and irrigation, which combined to reinforce the value to American commerce of supporting this type of agriculture. The Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation in the 50s were concerned that if the issue of hunger in the third world wasn't addressed, then poor people in those countries would be ripe for communist subversion. The Green Revolution, which is really the introduction of chemical agriculture under forced circumstances, uh, to countries like India was basically created as an antidote to social change. It was meant to reinforce patterns of inequality, which it did. The smaller peasants lost their land because they could not afford to keep up with the credit payments linked to the Green Revolution. The intensive water use has left large tracts absolutely desertified. The agricultural diversity that fed people has been wiped out, and yes, the production of rice and wheat has increased, but that is not an absolute increase in food. The production of legumes, of dals, of chana, of chickpea, of oil seeds, of mustard has all come down. Faced with the choice of crop failures and resulting worldwide starvation, the use of pesticides and herbicides seems inevitable. If we talk about pesticides specifically, they came out of the uh, defense industry. The first modern synthetic chemical pesticides were derived from nerve gases developed by the Germans in World War II. 
and they found that by some simple changes in the molecules, instead of having their greatest toxicity be for human beings, they could have their greatest toxicity be for insects. There were plenty of chemical factories left over from World War II. We got a raft of secrets from Nazi Germany that allowed us to make organophosphate pesticides that we did not have the capacity to make before. My uncle was uh, in the intelligence service in the army and went to the IG Farben plant and got all the chemical secrets that they had for making organophosphates as well as plastics and this in part contributed to a great expansion in our knowledge base for making chemicals that could be used in the pesticide industry. Through the chemistry of explosives that connects directly because of the chemistry of it with the chemistry of fertilizers. And then coming out of the war you have a whole infrastructure of industrial capacity that was war oriented with nothing to do. The impression I have is that chemical agriculture became the norm when it was clear that the progressive addition of rounds of fertilizer amendments to soils that are chemically based coupled with pesticide regimes that suppressed weeds and also controlled insect pests, worked best on large-scale operations where you could mechanize production and use aerial application of the pesticides. The chemicals that are used for pest control historically through the 1950s and early 60s were by design chemicals with long environmental persistence like chlordicone, DDT, chlordane, those are major chlorinated chemicals that have half-lives measured in decades rather than months or weeks. The idea was that they build up uh, a protective barrier in the soil against repeated infestations. Virtually all the chemicals I just listed have been banned and have terrible environmental consequences because of their persistence, their ability to concentrate up the food chain, and their concentration in food crops, particularly crops that have a heavy oil base like corn and others. The whole mentality of industrial agriculture is really similar to the whole mentality of war. Uh, humankind against nature, man against nature, and using the same kind of weapons that we use to dominate people in, in warfare. One of the newest and most versatile weapons in Dow's arsenal of chemical warfare and I think we can contrast that to the alternatives to organic farming or more agroecological approaches, which are gentler techniques, which don't involve the domination of nature, but really the living with nature. There's a USDA study from, you know, from information they got in 1998 that showed that the average revenue per acre on a farm larger than 2,000 acres was uh, this is per year, was uh, $21.40 per acre per year on a large scale farm. However, the average revenue per acre on a farm of 10 acres or smaller was uh, $1,960. And on our, farm. on our farm, it's probably somewhere around like. Uh, like fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars per acre. One of the reasons why large farms are relatively unproductive compared to small farms is that large farms the world over uh, tend to use monocultures. A monoculture is a single crop species planted over a very large area and large farms have to use that unproductive farming system because their size means that they have to mechanize a lot of their operations and it's difficult to mechanically plant or mechanically harvest more than one crop, yet that's terribly inefficient. The idea that the average production on a larger scale farm, the average revenue for a year is, you know, a little more than 20 bucks, I mean, how the hell can anybody possibly make a business out of that? And the answer is by having hundreds of thousands of acres. So I guess the point that becomes really important is the fact that that we believe that small farms are not efficient is because they do not have the subsidies. Whether these are farmers in third world countries like the Philippines or Mexico or these are small family farms in this country, they're all on the brink of extinction because the subsidies that should be provided to them, the support that should be provided to them is all being channeled 
to big agribusiness corporations. Let's see how the system works. The way the system works, in essence, is that it works to keep the prices low that farmers receive for what they produce while subsidizing the corporations like Cargill or like Archer Daniels Midland or Continental Grain that take U.S. farm products and export them so that they can put them onto the global market at prices that can undercut farmers anywhere else in the world. You see, Tommy, with the tools we have today, farmers all over the country can produce great surpluses. Since we continuously have a surplus of many of our grains and we have the lowest commodity prices in probably 15 years presently, the question is why do we continue to insist that we need a second green revolution, the biotechnology revolution, in order to feed the world. Thus, agricultural research in colleges, industry and government goes forward. Result, new products, new businesses, more jobs. Help yourself to a miracle. Yes, well, we've come down to Safeway, it's one of the world's biggest supermarket chains, to try and get the message across that they should not be selling genetically modified food. Uh, I come from England, uh, one of the countries where there's been a very big campaign on this whole issue. And really what we're saying now is that, you know, we need to stand back from this unnecessary and very dangerous experiment. I think the main concern here is that the, uh, the genetically engineered food, Safeway is GE free in, in Europe, and they haven't even uh, begun to label in the U.S which is somewhat of a concern and double standard for Europeans and, and United States citizens. Genetically engineered foods could be having effects on people right now, but because they're unlabeled, no one would know. Biotech is an incredibly broad subject area. I really, if you take the textbook definition, it's the use of living organisms or components thereof to make useful products, processes and services. All the food we've eaten all our lives, that our parents have eaten and our grandparents have eaten and so on, it's all been genetically modified just by various kinds of techniques. Many consumers would be surprised to find out that our modern tomatoes are derived from an, an ancient predecessor that was a tiny berry, in fact, that was quite toxic. It's through literally hundreds of years of selective breeding, that is, genetic modification, that we have the modern tomato. What we're talking about is the, uh, the extraction of, of genetic material out of a reprodu reproductive context a context that has been evolving with this piece of DNA over millions of years, taking it out, manipulating it as a chemical, and then putting it back into another reproductive context where it's going to operate in a different way. This, this type of manipulation, the transgenic manipulation, really has no precedent in history or in evolution. Here, in fact, is the answer to a dream as old as man himself, a giant of limitless power at man's command. The uh, beauty and peril of genetic engineering is that you can move genes from as far distant a species as a flounder into a tomato to ensure that you have a plant that's tolerant to very low temperatures because of antifreeze genes that are present in the flounder. But you could find that same gene in any number of other organisms. It was just easier to take it from a flounder than it was to take it from another plant. But you'll find those genes in plants as well. That type of engineering is made possible by the universality of the genetic code that plant or animal species can read each other's genetic messages. And in fact, you and a 
P <laughs> and a cow have all uh, about you know 60 to 70 percent of, of your DNA is very similar. You're much more closer uh, to these organisms here than you might think you are because an awful lot of the basic housekeeping genes are very very similar. The FDA considers them to be the same as traditionally bred crops so there's no label required, there's no testing required and we really don't know what's going to happen. It's an outrage. A man isn't safe even at his own dinner table. Something ought to be done about it. Why doesn't the government step in? In theory, the government has three agencies that could regulate biotechnology-generated agriculture. The first and foremost would be the Food and Drug Administration, but it decided, beginning in 1992, to allow the deregulation of these crops from its point of view because they were equivalent to existing plants and foods. A very convenient tool called the Substantial Equivalence Principle was cooked up to say, let's just treat genetically engineered organisms like conventional crops. Of course, they don't say that when they want to patent those same things. Then at that point, they say, these are novel, these are not natural. But when it comes to safety, they say, just like nature, exactly as nature made it. I sometimes call this ontological schizophrenia. FDA, uh, under the regulations as they exist at the moment, can, are only obliged to label if, in fact, there is a potential w problem with respect to safety and efficacy. Now, how the products of biotech are produced is actually a process. That's not a product in itself. FDA do not have any capability under, or any regulatory authority uh, to actually label based purely on process. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. Secondly, the U.S. Department of Agriculture could regulate these plants as they would any new plants. They decided that these plants did not comprise a new category of plantings compared to other hybrid type varieties that are already on the market. Sound science has demonstrated time and again that many biotechnological advances are safe and reliable. But if consumers at home and abroad don't share our confidence, they will reject genetically treated products and we won't be able to get a return on the enormous public and private investments that have been made in biotechnology. Then the EPA has the opportunity to regulate plants that might pose new environmental risks or would pose risks because they themselves, the plants, have pesticides in them. Rather than creating a new regulatory framework or new um, laws, uh, there was a decision made, a recognition that existing laws could be applied to this industry. And uh, at that time there was a term and a construct that was coined that is, is called the coordinated framework and that refers to the, what is supposed to be a, a, a viable, effective, coordinated effort uh, among those three agencies. So we have three different agencies. Each one, in my viewpoint, only half-heartedly or not at all, taking a, an aggressive regulatory posture to, to control this industry. There's a reason we have confidence in the federal bodies that analyze the safety of our food. They may not be perfect, but nobody believes they're in anybody's hip pocket. They're the world's best experts. We have an orderly, disciplined system here. Terry has global responsibility for biotechnology, regulatory, public policy, and external affairs for DuPont Nutrition and Health. He was formerly the APHIS administrator here in USDA. And might I add, Dr. Medley, it's nice to see that this professional life beyond government. We must continue to argue in multilateral forums like the WTO that our biotech products have withstood the strictest scientific scrutiny. It's nice to see that this professional life beyond government Based on our experiences, the existing FDA guidelines have been transparent, effective, and have functioned to assure the safety of our food supply.
The consumer certainly has a right to know what is in his or her foods, but placing the words genetically engineered, genetically modified, or bioengineered on a label does not provide content information. GMOs are stealth ingredients in cereals, snack foods, infant formula, pancake mix, and pet food. Will these stealth ingredients further fuel the cancer epidemic in America? We don't know. Will they produce life-threatening allergic reactions? We don't know. The majority of GMOs have been developed to withstand higher levels of pesticide spraying or to produce their own insecticides. Will these foods endanger more children's health than are already compromised? We don't know. With regard to labeling, we are opposed to mandatory labeling of these products. We feel as there are consumer benefits that are promoted other than the production benefits we have now, that those companies selling those products will want to clearly get that information to the public so that they can take advantage of that intended market. Uh, the market will drive that issue. FDA 92 policy for biotechnology foods and ingredients provides consumers with everything the activists have asked for except the ability to sow confusion and mislead consumers with government blessing. Choice is provided. If a consumer wants to buy food not derived from enhanced crops, they can buy organic and also pay the higher cost. If they want accurate and reliable information on health and nutrition, that is mandated by law. If they want to know if their personal preferences in regard to genetic modification have been met, companies are free to meet those preferences, provided there is sufficient consumer demand. The potential contamination of organic crops has created a nightmare for uh, those of us trying to ensure the integrity of our organic ingredients. We are now having to consider the cost of testing all of our ingredients, which could potentially be contaminated at some point in the growing or manufacturing process. And I really can't help but have this prompt a question to me that if the confidence is there in the safety of these products, why is there so much objection to labeling? Well, what's happened in England is that there's been really a, a total collapse in the market for GM agriculture. Uh, people over there, once they realised they were being fed food that they didn't want to eat, and once they saw Monsanto's advertising campaign, which was trying to make them feel guilty about blocking developments that would feed the world, it's obviously patent rubbish, people got very angry and they've decided they don't want to eat it. Contamination in this experiment is not a possibility. It's not a probability. It is an inevitability. And it's my contention that what these companies are trying to do is to say, oh dear, look, there's contamination all over the country now. Oh no, it's got into rape, it's got into field mustard, it's got into maize, it's got into barley, it's got into just about everything. Too late, horses bolted, what's the point of keeping the stable door shut any longer? It may be contaminated. Well, we did a study in Mexico, in a special area of Mexico. This is the center of diversification and domestication of corn, where corn was brought from the wild state into domestication and cultivation. And this area is recognized internationally as an area of diversity where we hold the diversity of genetic resources that we need to bring into our cultivated crops every year to confront problems like new pests, new diseases, drought, changing climate and so on and so forth. We were very surprised to find it immediately. We actually were expecting to see just negative controls from samples of these uh, land races, these criollo varieties in, uh, in the highlands of Oaxaca, in the mountains of Oaxaca in Mexico. And uh, to our surprise, we had very high levels of contamination already. As soon as I felt secure about our results, because we did not want to report something that was just spurious or, or wrong, I uh, contacted the Mexican government and uh, what they did immediately, which is I think the responsible, responsible thing to do, was to set up an independent study to see whether we were right or wrong. And uh, soon enough they showed that, that yes, we were right and their results are compatible with ours to really the quantitative detail. You know, it's not like an oil spill that you can put a boom around it. When we have genetic pollution, we cannot put a boom around it. There is no controlling it. For many years we have been uh, assured that these manipulations, that these transformations are under control, that uh, genetic materials are going to stay where we put them in the agricultural field and not go anywhere. Uh, 
there was talk about buffer zones that would be placed around transgenic fields, uh, thinking that pollen would not move out uh, or beyond those buffer zones. And I think uh, the first le level of importance of this discovery is that, uh, that we find that that control really doesn't exist. Uh, the sites that we looked into are uh, at least hundreds of miles away from any transgenic field, and also they are di distant from transgenic manipulations in time. We have the benefit of a, of a moratorium that the Mexican government placed on planting of transgenic corn. So we know that at least legally, since 1998, there shouldn't have been any transgenic plants nearby. Pollen can travel up to four kilometers. It knows no boundaries. And genetic modification is occurring on close to 100 million acres worldwide. It's going to be virtually impossible to, to keep a, a field from being contaminated in one way, shape, or form from genetic pollution. There is this uh, uh, policy contradiction in Mexico between banning the planting of corn but allowing totally open access to um, the international market of corn, especially the U.S. So Mexico imports about six million tons of corn from the U.S. every year. And in those six million tons of corn, uh, they know they are receiving about 30 to 40 percent transgenic corn that is not segregated and is not labeled. So there's no way to separate it. Supposedly, uh, these two policies are compatible in the sense that the imported corn is only going to go for consumption and not for planting. But that, of course, is a red herring in a place like Mexico where people have lived for thousands of years of corn in a very, very tight relationship. So most people in the countryside will plant what they eat and eat what they plant. The agency has been refining its policy pertaining to drift with conventional pesticides. Uh, There's a significant amount of work on that in recent years. Uh, but, but genetic drift has not been included in that. Uh, and um, we don't have a specific policy with regard to genetic drift. There have been fa cases of farmers in whose fields were found growing crops containing genes that were owned by companies to whom those farmers had not paid uh, a fee for, those, for the seeds to grow those crops or the technology fee that they're required uh, to use those crops. And what this meant was that the farmer had violated the intellectual property of some huge corporation. And it might have happened because wind blew pollen <laughs> onto the field, from a neighbor's field on, onto a farmer's field. Nevertheless, at least in Canada, courts have found that those farmers have violated intellectual property and owe a fee to companies whose crops they never wanted in their field. The biotech companies that create these products have no liability for them. And no biotech company has yet been capable of getting any kind of insurance policy for any of their products at all. So <clears throat> all of the agreements that they have when they sell these products to commercial farmers are, uh, are placing all of, you know, all of the accountability for any detriment caused by them on the farmers. So say commercial farmer pollutes organic farmer, then the organic farmer has to put a lawsuit against the commercial farmer. It's just like two people without any money whatsoever, like trying to fight a legal battle. A lot of these crops have been engineered with a, um, a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a naturally occurring soil bacterium which acts as a, an insecticide. The Bt plant exudes this toxin from every cell throughout its entire life cycle. Scientists are seeing residues in the soil up to a year after the crop has been removed. This corn, which is called Bt corn, kills monarch butterflies. And it's the pollen of this corn. Just the pollen contains enough of the toxin to knock out the larvae of the monarch butterfly. What Dr. Losi at Cornell found in laboratory simulations is that the monarch butterfly in his first studies died at about a 50% mortality rate. Subsequent studies suggest maybe only 7% of butterflies will die. It's still an immense impact in an evolutionary sense and a completely unanticipated one. Other non-target insects that would be affected are those that happen to ingest the pollen, which is toxic to any species that has a larval form, that has an alkaline gut, and Losey's work 
stands out more because it's a pilot study that, that should have been done 15 years ago when this technology first emerged than the fact that it showed a dramatic effect. They're increasing these feeding studies. The first time round, they probably they did a, quite a bit of feeding studies on the actual components, the, the products of the genes themselves. Uh, they didn't do quite as many, but they are now, of the feeding studies of the actual expression of these genes in the crop plants themselves. We have seen the development of insects that are resistant to the Bt crops and, uh, and the development of herbicide resistant weeds. So these technologies are dated. They're dated. They take a very long time to produce, and, uh, but they, they are defeated by biological rules very quickly. Now some of the crops being grown contain chemicals that are, are useful to manufacturing processes or contain pharmaceuticals uh, um, that, that, that we must not ingest. One example that I think it is uh, very interesting is uh, the corn that is being produced reportedly by this company in San Diego that uh, has spermaticidal properties. So it's corn that if you, if you eat it as a, as, a, as a man, you would become sterile. And we worry even more because of what is commonly called the Starlink scandal, in which industry and the regulatory agencies were supposed to have kept a particular corn off the plates of people in the United States and we're not able to. Their systems of segregation, their systems of controlling what went to our food plate didn't work. So Aventus Corporation produced uh, Starling corn, which is a genetically engineered corn. Um, EPA approved it only for animal feed because of concerns of uh, that Starlink could cause food allergies. The Cry9C didn't look like any known allergen. The one thing it failed on was stability because the notion, of course, is with these proteins is, is if they stay stable within um, a simulated gastric uh, environment, which is what they did, um, these proteins can then potentially be carried through and into the bloodstream and uh, institute an, an allergic response. The IgE uh, immunoglobulins are produced in response to this. So uh, the, the agency said, well, let's hold on a moment here. This looks like it's more stable than all of the other cry proteins. These are the cry proteins that are produced for the other companies that were introducing BT proteins in, into crop plants. And they said, well, uh, we really are concerned about this from a human health point of view. We have no proof. We have absolutely zero proof that it's an allergen, but it is more stable and we have to be concerned about that. Um, so in fact, they went ahead and gave a split approval. Now, of course, they've decided they're never going to do that. No company would ever want to do it again because it's just too difficult to segregate it all the way through and to ensure that you have identity preservation all the way through uh, because you no, know, if you're looking at every field and every mill in the country there is some probability that animal feed and human feed may get mixed up. We have now found that Starlink has made its way into the human food supply. It's contaminated corn products throughout the U.S. Uh, 300 food products have been recalled so far. Aventus is facing up to one billion dollars in costs related to the recent food recalls. Aventus has now petitioned EPA and said we believe Starlink is safe and we want you, Environmental Protection Agency, to allow Starlink in the food supply. After the fact. After the fact. In the case of Starlink, we never were able to get to a safety finding around human food use. And so uh, after quite a bit of review with that material out in the channels of trade and a lot of it being sort of held up in suspense until we resolved the issue, there was a question about whether we were going to retroactively approve that food use and, and ultimately we, we didn't. Um, we didn't issue that approval because we couldn't make that safety finding.
there are innumerable different cultures on the planet Earth. Many encompass a very small group, involving only a tribe or a series of villages. Such tiny culture groups dot the continent which the Earth people call Africa. On the other hand, the continent called Europe is largely covered by a huge civilized culture which has spread over many parts of the Earth. Being able to change whole cultural practices in these countries is not a trivial, trivial problem. Uh, as Florence Wambugu said, the real advantage of biotechnology is it's packaged technology in a seed. You don't have to teach these people to introduce new cultural practices because many uh, individuals have tried this over years since colonial times right up until the present day and they've not succeeded in doing it. It's incredibly complex to tr teach people new cultural practices. Whereas if you give them a seed, the, the technology is in the seed, so it's, it's actually neutral if if you like, insofar as, as the actual scalability, it would be the same for a farmer in a poor country as to a very wealthy farmer in this country. But it comes down to that, that we are saying that innovation and creativity is only going to take place in, uh, in labs with men in white coats. All that innovation and, and technology that has existed in the fields, uh, passed from one generation to generation, is being ignored. An issue in many parts of the world is, is vitamin A deficiency. People try to get vitamin A in the form of supplements to remote rural populations and have failed to do so. The consequence is uh, a disease called night blindness, which often degenerates into, uh, into, into, into literal total uh, blindness. We're, we're working on a project and I, I, Donna, in which you put in a gene that creates pro-vitamin A, beta carotene. You probably have heard from many people the, the story of golden rice and this from a scientific point of view was an incredible engineering feat for a scientist to be able to actually um, genetically modify a complete metabolic pathway so he went back to a very basic precursor of um, vitamin A production this was it's called journal journal diphosphate and then he stitched on all of the other enzymatic steps needed to produce beta carotene in rice I mean this is an incredible scientific feat. The vitamin A rice was a simple trick that could have been done 20 years ago in fact it could have been done by conventional means to breed plants that would have a higher concentration of vitamin A since there are neighboring varieties that already have high vitamin A contents. Uh, from a human nutrition point of view, of course the, the jury is still out as to how efficient that's going to be. They're still looking at issues of bioavailability. But it's an incredibly efficient way to, de to deliver these nutrients, especially to countries where nutrition is a real problem. There are plenty of indigenous species in the squash families, for instance, that have ex extraordinarily high amounts of vitamin A, as do sweet potatoes and other often pigmented carotene containing plants. To put the beta carotene gene into a rice plant uh, was really, I think, an artful sop in order to get more support to biotechnology, more than a cure for a nutritional problem in the public that would be consuming the rice. Using biotech, there's several ways that this can be addressed in addition to just introducing vi beta carotene, there's, there's other work going on in producing high um, iron content rice, again, by, um, iron deficiency, especially for women and um, uh, children, is a major problem in developing countries. Well, what those malnourished children and people who are not well, what they really need is a vaccine against a social disease called poverty. If only the health budgets and social safety net programs of whether United States or whether overseas, if only the governments were allowed to do their jobs by financial institutions such as the World Bank and IMF, we would not need rice with vitamin A. We would not need rice and other things with all the vaccines in it. I think though insofar as uh, the consumer is concerned, the real advantage is going to be the, in the area of uh, quality traits where they look at um, shelf life, taste and very important nutritional aspects both at the macro level, at the protein and carbohydrate and fat level, where you're looking at better ways to um, introduce a more balanced amino acid ratio into your diet, which is something 
of course vegetarians have to look at all the time. Using biotechnology you can do this for many different crop varieties so that for example you can have um, high lysine corn because the cereals are often low in lysine or on the other side you can have uh, sulfur rich proteins introduced into the legumes because they're low in sulfur rich proteins. At the micro level the inc there's incredible capability of improving um, the quality of um, vitamins and minerals especially antioxidants as we become more aware of the fact that we need to eat healthy food to stay healthy rather than always running to the doctor for cures although biotech has the answer to that as well but it's much cheaper and much more effective to uh, eat healthy in the first place rather than trying to cure the ills of ill eating later on in life and with biotech that's incredible capabilities. <laughs> Five point eight million people in the world today, about one and a half billion of them in abject poverty. About one person in seven, about eight hundred million people in the world, so malnourished that they cannot participate in work life or in family life, living on the edge of starvation. Genetic engineering clearly falls right within the Green Revolution mindset. It's another uh, productionist approach to dealing with problems of hunger, if indeed it really exists to deal with hunger at all. That's what Monsanto and other companies would have us believe. Probably it deals more with their bottom line than hunger, but let's take them at their word at face value and say it's an approach to dealing with hunger. First of all, if it could increase yields, that doesn't necessarily mean that it would have a positive impact on hunger. Just like the Green Revolution, it's an expensive technology. Genetically altered seeds are much more expensive than normal seeds. They usually require a technological package like Roundup herbicide that's expensive that goes with them, and they're clearly going to create the same kind of economy of scale that puts smaller, poorer farmers at a disadvantage, just like the Green Revolution. So even if they did significantly increase yields, they would still be likely to lead us back into the paradox of plenty. More production, more hunger, more poverty. Yeah, there is hunger and many of us are told that there is so much hunger because there are too many of us, it's because of overpopulation and we need to grow more food as the people indulging in genetic engineering would like us to believe and uh, people who have promoted industrial agriculture, green revolution. But we have to really understand that there is no problem of food production. In fact, the problem in the United States right now is overproduction. And yet, according to USDA last year, uh, the number of people who do not have adequate access to food had increased from 30 million from previous year to 36 million Americans not having adequate access to food. And the reasons for those people not having enough food to eat or for the fact that the 800 million people who are undernourished in this world lies in the fact that there's too much of social and economic inequality. If 800 million people are hungry today, every one of those 800 million people 10, 20, 30 years ago used to grow their food and feed themselves. World hunger is created by destroying people's capacity to feed themselves, which includes both a destruction of small farming systems as well as a destruction of people's entitlements through a highly inequitable economic structure which creates called corporate welfare by robbing the poor of their welfare. And that's in the rich countries and that's in the poor countries. 70% of the world today is fed by small-scale farming. Most of the food needs of the poorer parts of humanity are met by having biodiversity, rich farming. Biodiversity will feed the world, not chemicals. Ecological cycles will feed the world, not genetic engineering. I really think that this uh, technology has an awful lot to offer to small farmers like my father. Um, because he, in, in my early life, we couldn't afford actually to buy a lot of the chemicals, fertilizers or pesticides, etc., that, that you see used so much over here. And we lost a lot of our crops. We wouldn't have the same level of productivity and we lost a lot of our crops to both diseases in the field and at the post-harvest level. And I thought with, you know, with biotech, there's such incredible capability of using you know, that totally organic substance, DNA, uh, to be able to uh, improve the lot of farmers.
The farmers that have embraced genetic engineering are the farmers that are the large agribusiness farmers, growing huge, enormous monoculture tracts of uh, different soybean varieties or cotton varieties or, or in the, the Midwest, the corn varieties that are now genetically engineered. It is so easy to call anyone a farmer. Monsanto would like to call itself a farmer. In fact, very often in international negotiations, the, the issue is can corporations be farmers? And they, they would like themselves to be called farmers. Anyone who has an interest in making money out of agriculture calls themselves a farmer. But we have a very clear definition that the FAO has. Those who labor with the soil, with biodiversity to produce food. The connection with laboring is what makes a farmer. And those who don't actually work on the land, work in fisheries, work in forest-based agricultural production are not farmers and therefore many representatives so-called and many institutions so-called that are created to clamor for biotech seeds are basically France, Monsanto France, their biotech company France. A box of Vitae's, which is like $3 something, only less than 10 cents of it goes to the farmer in this country who grows wheat. So the question lies, where does the rest of the money go? And that's when it becomes very important to look at the vertical and horizontal integration of the, of the food industry. Then it goes into packaging, it goes into shipping. So you have a situation where, according to the latest census, there is no category of farmer on a census because when less than 1% of the population is involved in a profession, they cease to exist. So I said that they're on the brink of extinction in this country, family farmers. But if you look at the census figures, they're already extinct. The food processing system is really owned by multinational corporations and we've lost control of our food supply. And right now we're in a situation of how do we get it back? I think we support organic farmers, and I think we support organic farmers in our local areas. I think it's important that we begin to get back to our roots, where we, we shake hands with our farmers. We go to the farmers markets and we say, how did you grow these foods? Where's your farm? Can I come out and take a look? Can I walk around? Is it close by? Um, boy, I, I'd love to, to get to know you a little bit, find out some philosophies behind how you grow your food. My name is Jason McKenney, and uh, I'm a principal operator here for uh, Purisma Green's farm. I'm Katie Dwight, and I work with Jason here. And we both live in San Francisco and commute down here together and um, bring most of our vegetables back up to the city or um, to people on the coast here um, in Half Moon Bay. We're a very small-scale organic operation growing on a basically a four and a half acre plot. Pretty much single truck, single tractor operation going to farmers markets, uh, going to a community supported agriculture program and uh, sales to restaurants too. The kind of agriculture that we practice here is a very human scale agriculture. You know, we are talking about two people growing, you know, anywhere between 60 to 70 different varieties of vegetables and fruits on a very small garden-like plot of land um, for essentially eight to nine months of the year. And it's really a very different scenario given the very, the very personal care that we're able to give to everything, not to mention even all of the different, um, all of the different organic techniques that we use for soil maintenance. A lot of people, if they think about, you know, oh, I, I want to start a farm or I, I'm interested <laughs> in, in farming, um, they maybe have a kind of idealized view of what that's all about. And um, It's a bucolic crock. <laughs> <laughs> between weeding and, and harvesting, that's just about all we do. Yeah. And people don't think about yeah. what that means. I don't know what in, people think. You know, think, oh, yeah, the farm, that'd be great. I'll go out there and... I don't know, what do they think? Sit around in the sun or something? Well, it's maybe get other, <laughs> get other people to do their harvesting and yeah. eating. Yeah. Good 
Yeah, we were trying to figure out the other day how how long it usually takes us to build a pile. And it kind of depends on the time of the year, depending on how much manure we can collect. Um, but for a good part of the year, we're building them three times, three mornings a week. So I think it takes us maybe a month, a little over a month or so. So CSA, I guess what, what I feel so strongly about it is that um, one thing I think we lack in our society to get is community, and just a real strong, solid community. And so I think food is, is the basis of any, could be the basis of any community because we all need it and it nurtures all of us. So giving good food to people and making that connection, just I think it's a perfect way to create community. And it also allows for people who can't have a direct connection with the land to get a connection through the people that grow the food for them. CSA, which stands for Community Supported Agriculture, describes a relationship between a group of people gathered around purchasing and committing to purchase their uh, food, generally produce, directly from a farm. Live Power was one of the earlier CSAs and, and I think has a slightly different concept than a lot of CSAs. Um, a lot of CSAs are more like subscription farms where you'll get a box every week, um, but there isn't the sort of extended community involvement that, that Live Power has. Um, trips to the farms, um, we actually sort the vegetables each Saturday morning. So, you know, where another CSA, you go to a spot and pick up a box that's already set up for you. We take the vegetables as they come down from the farm and spread it out among the, the, the shareholders' baskets. Yeah, it's seasonal. And they grow in Mendocino County in a valley that's um, high up. The season is May to early December. So in May, it's spring vegetables, lots of greens. Um, and then summertime, it's um, summer vegetables, tomatoes and corn, summer squash, and then into the fall, which is always this incredible transition. I love greens and, and, and winter squash and root vegetables. And I, I always welcome that time of year in terms of food. Initially, the first couple of years, it was, um, a little daunting, you know, it's like, oh, and, you know, what do we do with, uh, you know, we get cabbages in the spring and in the fall, giant cabbages. We still, sometimes they're a bit daunting, but, you know, you knew you, you had to start really getting into the cycle, which now I, I love. It's a radically different relationship because it's an it's an it's a relation, it's an economic relationship of association, not of competition. And there's a common good that both parties are working toward and that is the the sort of sustaining of that farm and it, it it's uh it just it feels like the right thing to do <laughs> They use apprentice labor um, on the farm. Stephen Glory really committed to the educational aspects of the apprenticeship program, and they've started up sharing um, with a few other farms. So the apprentices will go away for a weekend and go to another farm to learn different things from that farm. One of the perennial issues for small farmers is sort of how to how to keep going. There's been such a loss of farmers in this country and the effort to provide a, an environment for people to learn and to learn sustainable farming practices is a, a really significant part of what Live Power Community Farm is doing. We need to be working with CSAs to ensure that their programs are available in inner city areas, low income areas. In a lot of ways the community supported agriculture program hasn't really penetrated that kind of a socioeconomic difference or strata, you know, it, it really um, plays into a stigma that, that I find consistently distressing is people thinking that organic food is, is really just for rich people. But uh, that's a really big reason why we, why we bring stuff to, um, uh, 
to the Alamany Farmers Market in the southern part of San Francisco, which is in their various farmers markets in the region. And a lot of the markets have extremely different feel to them. Um, some of the markets are kind of even more sort of shishi and yuppified than, you know, than a whole foods market. And the food, the prices, you know, the prices and the varieties of food that are there really show it. Alamany is definitely like a very low brow market. It's it's a place where people go for bargain. Yeah, but what you pick on that? Ten pounds, three dollars. Ten pounds, three dollars. Ten pounds. People don't really think or care about organic there, and I think that's a really big reason why we go there. It's because you know it's in our community, and it's a way of bringing food, you know, that we know, you know. It's direct from here, so we can give a pretty, you know, we can give a really good price for organic food. And what, you know, in many cases ends up being a very good price, you know, that people even expect just at the market itself. And I, I think it's, it's really had a, a pretty positive effect. There's been a lot of people, you know, who, um, you know, I wouldn't call them like organic converts necessarily, but like they know, they say, this stuff tastes a hell of a lot better than the guy next to you. I think in terms of making, of addressing that kind of a, um, that kind of a disparity that exists between, um, you know, in the organic market, the, the farmer's market is a much more viable tool for it than, uh, than the community supported agriculture program. I think for all of us who care about food, this is a very exciting moment, and especially at, at Seattle, at the World Trade Organization. We saw the role that the food and agriculture movement, not just in this country, but from around the world, played in mobilizing people, the younger people, the elderly, women, children, just about everyone. And so we are at this real important uh, point in time where we can demand a basic human right to safe, nutritious food. We have to build on a success from Seattle and demand a basic human right to that food. The entire edifice of genetic engineering is built on a reductionist Cartesian world order that genes are frozen, discrete atoms. They have no relationships with anything else. They will stay and behave exactly as you decide. They've traits and uh, qualities are. That's not how the world functions. The world functions through relationships. The world functions through constant dynamic flux. There are no discrete entities in biology. Genes are a total theoretical construction. decide whether mankind is bettered or destroyed by the products of science.